Welcome to Queens West Oahu Virtual Speaking of Health Lecture Series. My name is Eric Barsatan, and I'm the Manager of Physician Relations and Medical Staff Services here at the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu. The title for today's Speaking of Health Lecture is, I Didn't Plan to Be Here. This is about unscheduled Medicare. Right now, to the presentation, you could ask all our viewers to be on mute. And if you have any questions, please type your questions in the chat box and our speaker will answer them at the end of his uh, presentation. At this time, I'm honored and privileged to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ronald Corona. Dr. Ronald Corona is our CMO or Chief Medical Officer here at the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu, and the Medical Director of the Transfer Center covering the four hospitals of the Queens Health System. Dr. Corona earned his medical degree at the University of Hawaii, John A. Burns School of Medicine, and completed his residency at Orlando Regional Medical Center in Florida. Welcome, Dr. Corona. You may now proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Eric. And for those of you joining uh, the afternoon speaking of health, welcome. Um, I'm hoping that this time will be uh, worthwhile for you. One of the things as an emergency physician is that I hear people when they come in, this was not on their list for what they plan to do today. And in that kind of situation, you want to empathize with them and you want to make it as good of an experience as possible. There are options that are out there that folks might not be aware of. People know about the emergency departments and trust care that they receive in the emergency departments. But as, but as medical care technology has advanced, there are other options that we found are able to give people the care that they need in the setting that they would like at a reasonable cost as well. So I'll be covering those. So for today's session, what I'd like to get across are what some are the common reasons that people use the emergency departments and virtual urgent care for. One of the things that gives people some anxiety when they come in and talk to me in the emergency department is, I'm sorry to bother you. I know you folks are so busy, but what I'd like to do is share with you folks that are able to attend this, that across the nation, there are a lot of reasons why people seek out unscheduled medical care, and it is worthwhile to get it checked out by somebody who has experience and training to either give you next steps, treat an emergency condition, or at least help you feel better. If you do go to the emergency department, what to expect from an emergency room visit, and in the end, alternatives and what to expect from virtual urgent care visits. So doctors have a sense of humor, and when people come to the emergency departments, this is what we assume that they feel like. It didn't go as planned, something happened, I had something else to do, but now I'm here with you. So as an emergency room doctor, what I wanna do is make them feel more comfort and figure out what's going on because they didn't come in for a reason that they could wait or see their doctor. They came in because they thought that they needed to be evaluated right now. So in 2021, there were an estimated 139 million emergency department visits in the United States. That's kind of a lot even for me even for me to think about. And the top 10 reasons why people go to the emergency department to be evaluated and to seek out advice or diagnostics, stomach pain was actually the number one reason, a little bit less than 10%. People worry about heart attacks, chest pain will bring them in. If they have a hard time breathing, shortness of breath, coughing, fever, headaches at about 3%, pains, which also includes injuries, back pain and symptoms, vomiting that they can't control at home, and with current times, psychological, mental disorders, anxiety, stressors of those uh, nature. So if anybody comes to the emergency department, these are just the top 10 reasons why people come in to get evaluated. And as an emergency room doctor, I think they're all very appropriate. But it can be intimidating for people to come to the emergency department. So what I wanna share with you right now is what to expect if you do come in. Emergency departments have been around for a long period of time, but the physicians and the training that's been going into emergency departments really changed in the 1970s. It became a specialty where the people that are working in the emergency department and seeing patients were trained specifically for emergency evaluation and care of life-threatening conditions. Prior to that, if we think about maybe our parents or definitely in our grandparents, if they did go to the hospital because they were sick, it would often be a grouping of people or doctors who would be early in their training. 
or they would be a specialist in gastroenterology in the stomach and they moonlighted or they had re responsibilities to fill in in the emergency department of the hospital. So in those days, the people who were the professionals who were seeing people that came in might not have had specific training in life-threatening conditions. Today's modern emergency department is focused on detecting and treating conditions that would be dangerous for a person in the next two to three days without treatment. Some of them have to be treated right away in the first two or three minutes. Some things can be treated over a course of days with antibiotics, but that's really what emergency departments specialize in in the modern day. So when should you go to the emergency department? The kind of no-brainers. Definitely if you have symptoms or signs of a heart attack, a stroke, injuries with bleeding that cannot be controlled, or symptoms of concern when you want to be evaluated by a professional. Just want to go over a few of the symptoms that people could be experiencing if they're having a heart attack. Chest pain is the typical one. Uh, heaviness or pressure, feel like an elephant is sitting in the middle of your chest. It can also have difficulty with breathing or feeling like you can't catch your breath. And these things happen for no reason. Not like you were running, sprinting to catch the bus, and then you had these pains. But you could just be sitting around, and then you'll all of a sudden have this pain or difficulty breathing without it going away with resting. There's some other symptoms that if you add on top of it, really get us concerned and start to drive us in that direction. If people are nauseated at the same time as they're having the chest pain, or they break out into the cold sweats, there's a term that we call diaphoresis, which is that, not the dripping sweat, but that cold sweat that you get that just kind of beads up on your skin. As an emergency doctor, when I see that type of a thing, it usually is an indication that something serious is going on and it has to be investigated. Another common cause of people coming to the emergency department, and we really want them to come quickly, is signs of a stroke. There's an acronym, FAST, F-A-S-T, if anybody that you see or you experience has facial drooping, arm weakness, or speech difficulty, time is of an essence, and we want you to come into the emergency department. Don't drive in. Call 911, especially if you're in a location where 911 systems are very robust and they can get to you quickly. One of the things that can happen is those paramedics, those specially trained emergency medical technicians, can recognize these symptoms and actually communicate with us in the emergency department that these are the symptoms you're having, and we can get ready to see you as soon as you come into the door. So who would evaluate you? Um, going back to the other slide, if you want, had a question where you wanted to have a professional to talk to, tell about the symptoms that you have, and explain to you what you're feeling or if there's other testing that needs to be done, the people that will see you in an emergency department are actually varied at this point. Another evolution of medical care. People know about physicians, but in today's emergency departments, a lot of them are very busy and the experience has been able to broaden out the people who are evaluating your symptoms, including nurse practitioners or physician assistants. The faces that you see down here at the bottom of the slide, they're very happy, smiley folks. These are actually my peers in the emergency department, nurse practitioners and physicians. So how long should you plan on being there? One of the things that people comment on is, boy, if I go to the emergency department, I might be there a long time. It might be a long wait. But in actuality, 60% of the people across the United States, if they come to the emergency department, are discharged in less than four hours. If there are some symptoms, and this is totally based on the person and what they are feeling, they may require more testing and their wait might be longer, their stay in the emergency might be longer because we might have to observe them to see how are they progressing? Are they improving? Are they getting worse? And what do the, what do the diagnostics show? So what is it like to come to the emergency department? As you can see, this is a team of the people that would see the average person that comes into the emergency department at our hospital, which is the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu and Ever Beach. The advancements of emergency department care, we've learned in the past where there used to be a department with two or three beds, somebody would come in, you'd make them lie down and rest and not do anything. But as emergency medicine has done more research and grown, we've actually realized that people can be seen in different settings and different situations. 
As far as for how long is it going to take? In the United States, 71% of the patients are evaluated within the first 60 minutes of arrival to the emergency department. In comparison, in the 80s, this could be five-hour waits, six-hour waits. So the efficiency has really improved. For our experience here at Queens West Oahu, in 2022, the average wait time for all people who came in was less than 42 minutes. So we are actually ahead of the national average. We know that about 40% of the patients from our experience can actually be seen sitting up in a chair, on a bench, usually wearing their clothes. One of the uncomfortable things is in the past, everybody would come to an emergency department and they'd make you take off all your clothes, only leave on your underwear, maybe your socks and have a gown on. But now we've been able to find that people can be upright, comfortable, have a companion with them, and we can do the same kind of history, examination, and diagnostic testing for 40% of those patients. In the top right corner, the more typical thing that people would expect, <clears throat> a bed in the emergency department surrounded by a lot of tools, a monitor, a nursing staff. Sometimes we can even see people in a hallway in the emergency department if they need to be seen very quickly. In some cases, like a stroke, you would actually expect to be seen in a hallway because what we can do is we can move the patient through the emergency department at the same time as assessing them. Mobility, time for some of these time-sensitive conditions is actually an advancement in medical care. We have a lot of diagnostic tests. We have a lot of ways to figure out what's going on with you. And it comes down to the stories in the tests. People will get their blood tests drawn in the emergency department. The image on the top right corner is of a CAT scan machine. Ultrasound is another resource that we have to test people and to see what is going on with them. But in actuality, it does come down to the stories. So for you or your family member, as someone coming into the emergency department, important things that would be important for you to be ready to discuss. <clears throat> First off, it's why did you come in? Let's have a conversation. Please share with me. What are you concerned about? What changed today to make you worried? A lot of times people will have a change in severity or a change in location of a pain that they had before. And it's kind of concerning that they want to talk about. A lot of times the first person that they go to is Dr. Google. You go on the internet and you try to find out the symptoms that you're having. What can they mean? A lot of times, because this is a very comprehensive list, at the bottom it usually lists things that are potentially deadly and people get very worried about them. So when you've looked at your symptoms, when you've put them into Google, be ready to come and talk with me or my colleagues about what are you feeling, what happened, and that way we can put it together. Also be ready to talk about what medications do you take, how often do you take them, and at what doses, especially if there's been any changes in your medications in the last month, because changes in medications that help you remain with good blood pressure or good blood sugars, changes in those can make you feel odd. So those kind of alterations would be important to discuss. Do you have any allergies to medications? Medicines that I have that I can use to treat people for nausea, vomiting, or pain, some people can have allergic reactions to them or bad side effects. So please be ready to discuss those. And then what are your chronic medical conditions that you know of? Some people, and in the emergency department, we're very non-judgmental people. We know that life goes on. People see their primary care providers, They've been told that they have borderline high blood pressure, borderline diabetes. Sometimes it is something that's difficult to want to go back to your primary care doctor about. And especially younger people might avoid going back for a year or two years. If you've had borderline high blood pressure or borderline diabetes, something that your doctor wanted you to take care of, um, you've been smoking for 10 or 15 years and somebody who you've seen before has counseled you to stop, Please disclose that because those are important things for us to know about when you come in for something that's different. If there's an area that you're concerned about, say stomach pain, which was the number one cause for people to come to the emergency department, what surgeries have you had in that area? Because that'll help us find out if you might have a blockage, if we do have to worry about your appendix, gallbladder, or other organs that are in your abdomen. Have you had any fevers in the time that you've not felt well? Usually when people are feeling sick, they'll feel tired, they'll feel fatigued, sometimes they'll have fevers. 
let us know if you have a thermometer at home, what was it? What was that temperature? An unusual thing to ask that some people might be caught off guard with is how have your bowel movements been? But a lot of times that's actually very informative to us. Has there been a change? Have you been constipated? Does that indicate dehydration? Any change in the time that you've not felt well, if somebody has a bowel movement every three or four days, are you now having bowel movements every day and does it look smaller? Is it of a different color? These are some things that if you have unusual symptoms would be helpful for us to detect situations. And like I was talking about the heart attack, any unusual sweating during these episodes, that kind of cold sweat, as I said, is a symptom that usually catches our attention in the emergency medicine setting because people who are running, people are exerting themselves, lifting boxes, that's something that you would expect. But if you're just sitting around and you start feeling sick and you start having that cold sweat, that's something that would be important for us to know. So it takes a big team to evaluate somebody who comes into the emergency department. There's a lot of resources, a lot of people, and each one of those people really wants to help you get better. That's one of the great things about healthcare is the people that you get to work with in a hospital setting, regardless of if they're seeing patients face-to-face -face or if they're coordinating care, they truly want to help people at the core of their being. But this is a list of, if you just touch the emergency department, the people that you would interact with. You'd see the provider, one of those three types of uh, trained professionals who can help diagnose and evaluate you. Emergency registered nurses, emergency medical technicians, phlebotomists, who are the folks that draw your blood. That is a very specialized skill where they have a needle and you trust them to obtain the blood sample that the doctors are ordering. X-ray technologists, registrars. People often wonder why do we need a lot of information from people. But with the way that technology is so interconnected now, we can query the electronic medical record. And if you are a patient of a doctor's office that participates in an information exchange in one of the other health systems here locally, we can actually see what has been going on with your doctor, your lab results, your imaging results in the last few years. And that will help get a better picture of what could be going on with you. Unit secretaries are very important. They help us coordinate all the tests and the transportation for you to get to the different areas within the hospital. And if I or my peers need to speak to one of your specialists, we can get in touch with them and coordinate your care, discuss what has been going on with you outside of the hospital, and formulate a plan of what to do next. With all the different medications, we do have pharmacists. And this is a safety issue in that for orders that we put in for medications, there's a pharmacist that reviews the order, the doses, your listed allergies, and any kind of interactions, and lets us know if there could be a risk in prescribing this medication or treating you with it in the emergency department. The emergency department is a stressful location. Sometimes you need a social worker to speak with, especially if there is a lot of stress, adaptation to injuries that have just occurred, case managers to help with care coordination outside of the hospital. And one of the big things that I would like to highlight is when you come to the emergency department, you will see that it is a clean environment. The floors are clean, the walls are nice, the equipment is in the correct location, the rubbish is emptied. Our housekeepers, our environmental service folks are one of the most important people to allow patients and their family members to feel comfortable and good about the care that they're receiving in an emergency department. When you look around and you feel that the location, that the environment is clean, it's controlled, it gives you a feeling that your care is good, which is really a true reflection. Also in stressful situations, we do have at our facility a chaplain who can assist people with some of their spiritual stresses, as well as to get support if they need to reach out to um, people overseas or other situations such as that. So with all the workup, what are the results that happen? One of the other things that people are worried about when they come in is, Doc, I don't want to stay in the hospital. In my experience, we've heard people say, you know, I, I worry about coming to the hospital because 
people I've known have gone in and they've been told that they have something that's bad. Well, sadly, that's one of the reasons why um, you come to the emergency department to find out if there's something that we can treat and get you better for. Sometimes that does require the patient to be admitted and stay in the hospital for a day or more. But to be a little reassuring, of all the people that come into the hospital every day, our experience has been about 16% of those people have to stay overnight. Some of them are there for emergency surgeries. Some of them are kept for heart or neurologic testing. Some medications can only be given by IV, and so we'll keep people in the hospital for that. Or if they have breathing problems and we find that their oxygen levels are low, if we need to keep them in the hospital for oxygen treatment while their respiratory problem resolves or improves. However, on the good news, that means that 84% of the people that come into the emergency department are able to go home. Those people that um, come in, we will see them, we'll evaluate them, hopefully be able to give them some relief, improvement in their condition, or a plan for what the next steps are going to be. Some people get injured and they get stitches. Those are pretty straightforward and easy. A cast for a broken bone. Sometimes some people will have those symptoms of chest pain or maybe a little bit of slurred speech. We'll do some testing and not everybody has to stay in the hospital because we'll have a battery of tests that we can do to sometimes rule out a heart attack or a stroke as the cause of the symptoms, in which case we can discuss outpatient follow-up, follow-up in the office with your regular healthcare team, and that way you can go home and be comfortable. Prescriptions for medications is another leading cause for people to come to the emergency department and then be able to leave with a care plan. And also to talk with somebody, evaluate their symptoms, use the diagnostic tools that we have, and clear you for right now. Right now, meaning in the next few days, with a plan to follow up in an office with a professional. So with all of this that we're talking about, you know, it's America, and how much does this cost? According to the U.S. stats, there's an estimated 83% of the patients that actually come to the emergency departments in the United States, and they're covered by some type of insurance. With that being said, there can be posted amounts for things, but it varies based on your agreement with your insurance company. 83% is definitely a majority of the people that come in, so a lot of folks will have situations that we might not know about because it's an agreement with that person and their insurance carrier. So those costs are based on your agreement with your insurance carrier. We will bill the insurance carrier and when you look at your explanation of benefits or the pamphlet that comes at the beginning of the year or during open enrollment, there will be a section that will say, what will your cost share be in emergency visits? I encourage folks after this WebEx to kind of take a look at their next convenience, just to have an idea of if I do choose the emergency department to evaluate my symptoms, what cost share do I have? Is it a flat rate? Is it a percentage? For folks that don't have any insurance or just as an idea, uh, the cost for an evaluation can start at $1,000, and then it can increase based on the tests and the treatments. Some people come into the emergency department, need or request advanced testing like an MRI. Those things will have costs associated with it, but if they're really warranted for your health and for your safety, it can be worth it. One of the things that we do tell people is the reason why there are all these resources available, but why the cost is high, is that you're doing about three weeks of evaluation within three hours. So that expedited treatment, expedited evaluation, sometimes will cost a little bit more. But when we're ruling out a stroke or something that's life-threatening, it is worth that for you. So with that being said, emergency departments have been around as long as hospitals been around, they provide great care for the appropriate reasons. But as medicine has evolved, there are other locations, alternatives to the emergency department. So I wanna cover those. Urgent care is one of the settings that have popped up in the last 15 to 20 years. Here on Oahu, through the Queens Health System, we actually have five spread out across the island from west to east. Um, we have one just down the street from our hospital at uh, Queens Island Urgent Care at Empower Health in Kapolei. There are three locations on the east side and in urban Honolulu in Kahala, Kapahulu, and Kakako, 
as well as one central in Pearl Kai. These locations, as you can see, are open Monday through Sunday, so seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. They're a great alternative resource for people to seek care with trained professionals in a setting that's not as highly resourced as the emergency department if you don't necessarily need those. Some common conditions that urgent care is treat, sprains and strains, minor cuts and lacerations, they can do stitches, flu, fever, mild burns, say you burned yourself while you were uh, making Simon on the stove, got a bit of a scald, maybe a few blisters, but nothing too severe, but you need some, treat, uh, some treatment for that. Urgent care is a great setting for that. Um, especially during flu season, cold season, sore throat, coughs, bronchitis, stomach aches, nausea and diarrhea, sinus infections, ear aches, skin rashes, animal bites. Those are things that urgent cares are set up for. Your time in the urgent care is very quick. You're seen by trained professionals, and it's a setting that gets you the care you need in the time that you need it. Some of the other treatments that are available at urgent cares that are similar to emergency departments, there are blood tests that are available. Urine testing, pregnancy testing, basic x-rays, EKGs for chest pain or palpitations or feeling like your heart's fluttering. IV fluids can be given in the emergency department setting as well as stitches. For those of you who watch on TV and there's Dr. Pimple Popper, people will see skin infections and abscesses. Urgent cares can do those as well to help people uh, get their infections treated and feel better and recover. One of the things that as physicians we really enjoy is if somebody comes in with something that can be easily treated and improved, it makes us feel good and smile at the end of the day. Earwax that blocks your hearing is something that urgent cares can help to remove and immediately improve people's lives. If something can't be taken care of in the emergency department, they do have a panel of specialists that they can refer people to. In contrast to emergency departments, urgent care is a much cheaper visit than an emergency department. Um, it's a centralized location. They do have this, some of the same testing and resources, but they don't have that broad spectrum of emergency department technologists, emergency department uh, nurses, um, radiology technologists. So in that way, you can get the same care, but in a cost-effective way. Uh, anybody can walk into an urgent care and the Queens Island Urgent Cares will take in all insurances with the exception of out-of-state Medicaid, insurances from outside the United States or travel insurance. And if you're a Kaiser beneficiary, they can bill Kaiser, but there might be a difficulty with the um, non-coverage notice. And so we would ask you to do an estimate. Otherwise, it is also an option to pay for your treatments just on your own. So as time evolves, another thing that has been leveraged is the use of technology. A lot of folks have iPhones, tablets, computers at home with cameras. Driving to a emergency department or to an urgent care center, when you're not feeling well, you got a runny nose, your head is stuffy, you feel all cloggy, isn't the most enjoyable thing. So technology has been advanced to the point where the communication is so good that we can actually do virtual urgent care visits. This is a flyer for something that we're incredibly proud of, which is our Queens Virtual Urgent Care Program. It's a fast and convenient way, as the photo shows, somebody not feeling well using just their phone. They're open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And they can help you with minor to moderate medical issues. The thing that I like to put out here because we're in Hawaii, is the blazing sevens. If you're not feeling well and you wanna see somebody, seven, seven, seven. Seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you're within that, why don't you seek out the Queens Virtual Urgent Care? They might be able to help you. So this is a national trend. As you can see here, Amazon has set up their own virtual urgent care. Kaiser Permanente has also set up virtual urgent care for their members across the nation. Uh, these are things that, as the technology advances, a lot of different healthcare providers are getting into this area. Where did we develop our virtual urgent care from? Well, it started during COVID. We actually started up one of the best COVID hotlines in the state of Hawaii in March 2020 because there was a lot of 
concern. People were locked down. They're not able to go out. There wasn't a lot of information, but we did need to talk to people, order COVID tests, and let them know about the precautions, especially if they lived in homes with other family members, friends, how to isolate and how to treat themselves and when to come in. With all of the experience that we gained from using technology for the COVID hotline, two years later, Queens has used that to pivot into the virtual urgent care space. So who is Queens Virtual Urgent Care for? Really, it's for the general public. Anybody locally can log in and ask for help. But if, especially if you're a Queens Health System employee or somebody who has a doctor in the Queens Health System, we can access your records and have that coordinated care and give you the best care for the symptoms that you're having. Sometimes your doctor might even recommend that you call into the virtual urgent care, especially if you have a primary care provider who's within the Queens Health System. If they can't fit you in, they're overbooked, or you're, you have a need outside of the clinic hours, if they close at four o'clock or five o'clock, they might refer you to the urgent care, the virtual urgent care, so that you can be seen. Also, our nurse triage line will recommend people if they have symptoms or conditions that can be handled through the virtual urgent care to contact them. So who are they? One of the things that we're proud of in contrast to the large national groups like Amazon and the Kaiser, is that the Queen's Virtual Urgent Care is staffed by local professionals. These are folks that live and work here, know the local community, know the things that are available. We have eight advanced practice registered nurses, which is a fairly robust group of people who, who will see people and patients on the virtual urgent care platform. There's backup support from emergency medicine physicians when that is needed. The patient um, contact center is also a key part of the virtual urgent care who will help you um, navigate your way onto the platform as a, well as coordinate some care and referrals. The medical director for the successful program is Dr. Brandy Gary, who is one of our long-term, very trusted, high quality physicians directing this endeavor of virtual urgent care. The photo and the write-up on the right is just an example. This is Phoebe Packer, one of our nurse practitioners who was um, awarded the provider of the year. The quality of the people that are available to talk to and to get your recommendations, your prescriptions from on the virtual urgent care are top notch. So what's the experience like? Once you log in, there will be things like this, these tiles, and it's very familiar to if you were signing up for a, an appointment online for a restaurant or ordering something. You can see here in um, respect to this being an offshoot of the COVID hotline at the beginning, they do provide care for COVID-19 visits as well as for follow-up. But as it's progressed, they've expanded into the different conditions that can be very easily taken care of on virtual urgent care. Coughs, cold sores, if you need a prescription for an EpiPen because yours ran out, general medical advice, motion sickness, emergency contraception, and even a work note. If you think about your boss told you you need a work note to come back to work and the emergency department visit might be $1,000, you might not want to use that option and look for something that's easier where you could do it from your home, like a work note. The virtual urgent care uh, can either be a face-to-face -face visit, they can do a telephone call, and later in this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about what an e-visit is, which is an asynchronous messaging visit. Virtual urgent care, even though you can't touch somebody, they can order some tests for you where you can go to a clinic and get those tests drawn and then stay in your car. Like flu swabs, as you see commercials for RSV or respiratory succinctovirus, uh, when people are getting sick, especially during the winter coming, and COVID. Um, they can order some Im limited injuries, um, images, excuse me, and physical therapy referrals. Um, blood work is not something that they're able to order for you. Advanced imaging like MRIs or CAT scans are not something virtual urgent care would be able to do or prescriptions for controlled substances. So how to schedule a visit is you would go to the, if you have my chart, it's an option that's able to be selected. Or as you can see down at the bottom, you can call a telephone number, the 691. 6789. 6789 is an easy number to remember. And you can see on the web interface that just like checking into a restaurant, 
you could pick a time and a day where you'd want to talk to somebody on the virtual urgent care. So I mentioned that I would cover e-visits. E-visits are what's called an asynchronous visit where you feel like you want to talk to somebody, maybe get a prescription, talk about a condition, but you don't really need to see somebody right away or face-to-face -face virtually. You can sign up for an e-visit and you could get a response over the email from a healthcare provider uh, within two days. It's not set up for everything. Chest pain, like I said, trouble breathing, stroke symptoms are things that you should go to the emergency department for. But some of those other um, mild, minor to moderate conditions could be accomplished by an e-visit. How do you navigate to the Queen's Virtual Urgent Care site? If you go to www.queens.org, right where these uh, bright red stars are, there's a Get Care Now tab. You can tap on that, and it'll take you to the screen, which would be Virtual Urgent Care Schedule a Visit Now. This is what you would see, and the red star also is to the left of two buttons. If you already have a Queen's My Chart account, you can click on that. And if you don't, then you can click on Schedule as a Guest. Very convenient, you can do it all from home. And as you can see from that telephone number, 808-691-6789. So in summary, unscheduled care. There's never a good time for anybody to get sick. We're, very, we're all very busy. We have things that we would like to do. Hurt, sick, pain, concern, anxiety, disrupt us, and we just wanna get better. What we want to do at Queens is to help you when and where you need it. And our goal is to help you because fear and anxiety can be improved if you have confidence in those helping you and know what to expect. So mahalo for the time that you spent listening to this presentation. Um, take care of yourself. We wish you the best. We want to be your lifetime partner uh, in your healthcare, and hope that we continue to earn your trust as the Queens Health System. Uh, Eric, I'll turn it over to you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Corrado, for the great presentation. Right now, we'll proceed with the Q&A or question and answer portion. Again, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box right now. Let's see if we have any. Well, one of the questions that came in, doctor, is that um, it said for the ambulance services, are you able to tell them which emergency department you can go to if they have an option? Um, that is, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Depending on the location where you are on any different island, um, the available emergency departments to go to are protocolized. Uh, here on Oahu, um, we are the only emergency department within a 10 mile radius um, of some places. So if you are if you are um, calling 911 for evaluation by the ambulance and you need to be transported to the hospital, if you are anywhere west of probably the H1, H2 merge, we would be your emergency department of choice. Um, if you're in the central corridor, uh, most likely they would take you to Wahiwa General, which is geographically that close area. And Aia and um, Pearl City, it would be Palimomi. If you're in the town area, uh, anywhere from Kalihi eastward, uh, there are hospitals that uh, you could request. And in that case, the ambulance would be able to take you to locations such as Kokini, uh, Queens at Manamana, uh, Straub, uh, if you're a child or a woman, uh, Kapilani. Um, but depending on the region, it would be the closest facility. Uh, if you're on the different islands, such as the Big Island, where there's three major hospitals, um, they are geographically very separate. Uh, North Hawaii in Waimea, Kona Community Hospital, and Hilo Medical Center, in which cases those ambulances might take you to uh, the closest facility. Stroke and heart attack might be one of the situations where you might be taken outside of that um, geographic area to, take, to be taken to a place where they might have a cardiac catheterization lab or one of those things where they talk about angioplasty or a heart stent. Um, with some of the technology, virtual urgent care um, and WebEx and those platforms are 
incredibly helpful for things like stroke for physicians, where you can actually be somewhere on the other side of the island, say in a uh, Wahio General Hospital, away from places where there would be a neurologist. But through technology, those doctors can call and ask a neurologist to evaluate you to see if you'd be a candidate for a stroke medication. Um, but that is a terrific question. Thank you for all the information. That's uh, great information. Uh, the other question that came up is, um, besides strokes uh, or stroke, uh, what other symptoms, conditions, or situations whereby you wouldn't recommend a person to drive themselves to the uh, ER or have someone drive them? Um, other than a stroke or a heart attack, um, if you think you perhaps broke something that's important for you to drive, uh, probably be better to either ask a friend or you could call an ambulance. Um, local people, we are terrific in that we will not want to bother anybody, uh, but we have seen people uh, wrap a broken leg with a, with a couple sticks, um, something that's bleeding and soaking through um, and driving themselves in. Um, also, if you think that you're going to pass out, we would recommend you call 911. Um, yep. Local people are great. They will find their way. They will find their way to us and we'll take care of them. Very good. Actually, those are the two questions that came in. Um, uh, are there any last minute questions from anyone? This is your last chance to put your question on the, uh, um, on the chat box. Give you a couple of seconds there. Because if not, then that concludes our, uh, <clears throat> our speaking of health for October. Again, the Queen's West Oahu Virtual Speaking of Health Lecture Series is the third Thursday of each month at 12 noon to 1 p.m. Please join us for the next lecture, which is scheduled for Thursday, November 16th. And the topic will be related to diabetes since November is National Diabetes Month. So look out for the information. Uh, again, on behalf of our Vice President of Operation, Robin Kolilani, our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ron Kuroda, and the entire Queen's Medical Center, West Oahu, Ohana, Mahalo nui lua. Thank you very much for joining us today. Until next time, please take care and always be safe.